short on answers. Well, I, I don't know the White House tap dances around questions about know. undercover Planned Parent videos. Laid to rest, a cardinal who once served as the Archbishop of Washington now rests in our nation's capital. Atrocities documented. Photos of persecution may help bring attention to those still facing danger in Syria. And digging through biblical history, archaeologists unearth what may be the hometown of Mary Magdalene. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Friday, July 31st, 2015. Good evening from Washington. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick with your News Now. Planned Parenthood faces new questions tonight on its response to the recent undercover videos. For one, did it fake a website hack this week? The Obama administration is also being questioned, as Catherine Zeltner reports from the White House tonight. Catherine? Brian, the recent undercover videos pose many questions. Is Planned Parenthood selling aborted baby parts for profit? Are their research tactics illegal? But one thing is clear tonight, the White House sides with Planned Parenthood, calling the videos fraudulent. Facing questions on whether President Obama has seen the undercover videos, the White House is short on answers. Uh, I don't know if he has or not. Well, I, I don't know if he's, if he's seen any of them. Uh, not that I'm aware of. But when White House Press Secretary Josh Ernest does respond, the lines have a familiar ring. There's ample reason to think that this is merely the tried and true tactic that we've seen from some uh, you know, extremists on the right to uh, edit this video and selectively release an edited version. Recently, an organization that opposes safe and legal abortion used secretly recorded, heavily edited videos to make outrageous claims. When pressed on where the White House gets its talking points on Planned Parenthood. And I'm merely repeating what I've seen that they've said uh, and has been reported publicly about what they've said. Thursday's press briefing came as the abortion provider claims it was hacked by extremists. But some journalists, including the Federalist, speculate the group orchestrated the hack as a PR tactic, noting suspicious online coding and how Planned Parenthood later said the site was undergoing maintenance. The alleged website hack comes days after the abortion provider hired crisis PR firm SKD Knickerbocker. Meanwhile, Indiana's governor clears Planned Parenthood of any wrongdoing in that state's investigation. The results from the remaining states and federal investigation of Planned Parenthood are still uncertain. Brian. Catherine Zeltner at the White House. Thank you, Catherine. Some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. America's longest serving cardinal is laid to rest here in Washington today. Cardinal William Baum was 88. His massive Christian burial at St. Matthew's Cathedral was attended by 10 cardinals as well as bishops, priests and laity. Baum was Archbishop of Washington from 1973 to 1980 before serving in several leadership roles at the Vatican. He is one of just two cardinals who voted in both 1978 conclaves and the 2005 conclave, the other Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, now Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. Cardinal Donald World joins us from Washington's Cathedral of St. Matthew, where Cardinal Baum is laid to rest today. Your Eminence, you called this man a longtime friend. Give us, a, give us just a glimpse of that friendship. The friendship goes back all the way to when I was a young priest and he was Archbishop here in Washington. And I went to him because we wanted to talk about a couple of things. The beginning of the Fellowship of Catholic Scholars, the, the catechism that became the teaching of Christ, and how we were to work with all of the new ecumenical and interfaith projects. Uh, I was a young priest then working on that catechism and he was a great guide uh, and assistant uh, uh, assistance to us as he offered all kinds of good advice. At the, at the heart of what he had to say to us was, remember the church is the presence of Jesus. In fact, when asked about his greatest contribution to the church, he responded, celebrating mass and absolving sinners. Is this the Cardinal Baum you knew? Yes, he was first and foremost a priest. And that's what a priest does at the heart of his ministry, celebrate the Eucharist and absolve sinners in confession. 
Cardinal Baum never, ever lost that sense of priestly identity, no matter how many other responsibilities he had, no matter how great were his responsibilities in the church. He focused on his ministry as a priest, and I think that's what endeared him to so many of us who saw in him an example of living and loving the priesthood. With his death, I understand the only surviving member of the College of Cardinals that elected St. John Paul II is now Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. What did this generation of leaders give us that we have in our church today? I think when we look back to those leaders and then we see in that pontificate of now St. John Paul II, what we see is a great stability that rests on the received teaching of the church. John Paul II provided for the church an interpretation, implementation of the Second Vatican Council, and a whole magisterium in all his teaching that guides us today. And those cardinals that elected him, they realized, they recognized the need of the church for a solid foundation that St. John Paul II provided. Cardinal Baum, just part of that very valuable history of our church. Cardinal Worrell, thank you so much for taking time to be with us. Your Eminence, thank you. You're very welcome. And Hillary Clinton calls for an end to the U.S. trade embargo on Cuba. During a Florida campaign stop, the Democratic presidential candidate challenged Congress to act. This is in sharp contrast with the Republican candidates, Florida Senator Marco Rubio and former Florida Governor Jeb Bush. The Republican-led Congress is unlikely to lift the embargo in place since the Cuban Missile Crisis in the early 1960s. Joining us tonight is B.B. Hidalgo, the formerly, uh, who formerly worked for the Archbishop of Miami on Cuban issues and the role of the church in Cuba and the U.S. Would the trade embargo, would lifting of that embargo do anything to relieve the condition of Catholics in Cuba oppressed? Absolutely. Uh, the Castro re regime has used it as, a, as an excuse for decades. And in terms of the, the poor conditions in Cuba that Catholics and all Cubans have experienced, by removing that excuse, you're giving really new opportunity for Cubans on the island. Do you think the Pope will be able to influence the Castro regime to change its oppressive tactics? Well, uh, the Pope, going back to Pope John Paul II, he had quite an influence in just opening a space for the Catholic Church in Cuba. That had a really significant impact beginning in 1997. Now with this pope, even just the brief meeting he had with uh, Raul Castro, uh, Raul afterwards said, you know, I might consider becoming a Catholic again. That's, those are baby steps, but important. And that kind of conversion of heart can lead to other change. Ahead of the pope's visit to Cuba, you're part of a panel with Archbishop Wensky and others in Miami. What's the focus of that discussion? Well, the Archbishop has played a very important role in the divide and bridging the divide between Miami and Cuba, going back, way back when he was auxiliary bishop. Uh, so this is an opportunity, and FIU, where it's being hosted, also plays an important, an important role in facilitating dialogue. So this is an opportunity for Cubans on the island who work with the church in Cuba and Cuban Americans in the, Uni in the United States to come together and talk about how we can continue to keep working together through the church, through the largest NGO on the island, and really the only one, to, to facilitate change and, and uh, to, bring, to really unite the Cuban family. That's the focus of the Archbishop. Well, we hope to see some progress. Bibi Hidalgo, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me, Brian. And a former campus police officer who fatally shot a man during a traffic stop is released on bail tonight. Ray Tenzing, who was fired from his job as a University of Cincinnati officer, pleaded not guilty to murder charges. His bond set at a million dollars and he was released after posting 10% of that. Tenzing is accused of killing Samuel DuBose earlier this month. DuBose was stopped on the campus of UC for having no front license plate. That is required in Ohio. In a Colorado courtroom, a startling outburst from a woman claiming to be the defendant's biological mother. This happened during the sentencing phase of the trial of James Holmes, convicted of killing 12 people in a suburban Denver movie theater. The woman was pulled out of the courtroom kicking and screaming. The judge sentenced her to three years, or three weeks rather, in jail for contempt of court. 
Chilling new video and 911 calls capture the panic and fear from the more recent theater shootings in Lafayette, Louisiana. Wyatt Goolsby reports. New surveillance video shows Louisiana shooter John Russell Hauser buying his movie ticket, calmly walking past a concession stand and right down the hall, straight into theater 14. Less than 15 minutes into the movie, Hauser pulls out a 40 caliber handgun and fires off at least 13 rounds. These are the frantic 911 calls that began pouring in. There's a, a shooting at Grant 16. And he shot right at people. There's two people shot, two people shot. Police race to the scene. So we need everybody over here saying anybody you got. Police say the shooter initially tried to escape by blending into the fleeing crowd. Everybody hang on. They said he's inside, he is reloading, he has a weapon, we have an active shooter here. The presence of law enforcement caused him to turn the gun on himself, according to officials, but not before killing these two women and injuring nine more. Suspect is down. Suspect is down. We have several more victims inside with gunshot wounds. Thursday night in Lafayette. Amazing. Hundreds attend a celebration in remembrance of the two victims just one week after their tragic deaths. I just want to say thank you for everyone involved in finding my daughter on that horrible day. The community-wide event titled Unite, Honor, Heal. And God's grace will lead me on. Wyatt Goolsby, EWTN News Nightly. Thank you, Wyatt. Search crews from several countries weigh in on a recent piece of wreckage that may be part of a missing Malaysia Airlines jet. Officials from Malaysia, France, and Australia all believe the wing part that washed up on Reunion Island belongs to a Boeing 777. Only one Boeing 777 is unaccounted for right now, Malaysia Airlines Flight 370. The debris is being taken to a laboratory in France for expert analysis. The Boy Scouts of America's decision to allow gay adult leaders creates a dilemma for some church leaders. Church-sponsored scout groups may continue to exclude gay leadership for religious reasons, but they're still concerned. Charleston Bishop Roger, Robert Gulemone is cautiously hopeful that Catholic chartered groups can maintain relationships with the Boy Scouts. We've had a good, uh, you know, almost century of good relationships. I would hope that that can continue um, in terms of our Catholic chartered units, but we have to look and see. Um, if, if we can continue to do this, Within the framework of our Catholic uh, environment, our Catholic teaching, I say let's go for it. It's a good program that Scouts offer, but we have to we have to watch what's going to happen as a result of these changes. Bishop Gulemone says 80 percent of Scout groups are religiously chartered. This week's decision by the Boy Scouts took effect immediately. Well, the World Health Organization calls a newly developed vaccine against the deadly Ebola virus highly effective. Trials of the single-dose vaccine began in March in Guinea. That's one of the three West African nations at the center of the Ebola outbreak. The vaccine has shown such promise that it's now extended to all people at risk after close contact with an infected person. The WHO says more research is needed, but the results so far on the trial show it's 100 percent effective. Two thumbs up from George H.W. Bush. The 91-year-old former president is recovering from a fall in his summer home in Maine. He tweeted a new photo to his 177,000 followers saying, who knew jumping out of planes was safer than getting out of bed? Thanks to all of you for your kind get well wishes. The former president broke a bone in his neck when he fell. The elder Bush who went skydiving on his 90th birthday is expected to make a full recovery. Coming up, which city will become the first to host both the summer and winter Olympics? We find out. And these graphic photos of persecuted Christians bring attention to those still suffering in Syria. Thank God for Friday and thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Brian Patrick. Shocking images smuggled out of Syria recently displayed at the U.S. Capitol practically cry out for help. Jason Calvi has that story tonight. Alarming, disturbing, sad. Images so gruesome, they require this warning. Tortured bodies, the lives of women and men snuffed out. These images are so very difficult to look at, which is why we're not showing them to you tonight. This exhibit is put on by the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. 
Democrats, we felt that the situation in Syria right now was one in which we could not stay silent, where we had to try to shed a spotlight on the crimes that are currently occurring, and that to do so, we were trying to do for the Syrian people something that did not happen for the Jews during the Second World War. A former Syrian military photographer says the 50,000 images show people who died in Syrian prisons. It should appeal to everybody's conscience to hope for a resolution. The Syrian government claims the photos are fake, but the FBI says the images were not manipulated. The photographer donated these to the U.S. Holocaust Museum. I think all too often there's a tendency to want to look away and think that it's someone else's responsibility. And I think our hope right now is that the people in Congress, the American people more broadly, recognize that unfortunately these crimes are happening. They're happening today. The U.N. estimates more than 220,000 people have died in the five-year Syrian civil war. Now we can see some of their faces. While their feet no longer walk this earth, they still call for help. At the Capitol, Jason Calvi, EWTN News Nightly. Thank you, Jason. Tom Brady's lawsuit against the NFL will be heard in New York. That's an initial victory for the league. The NFL is headquartered in New York City. The New England Patriots quarterback is challenging his four-game suspension. The league punished him for using underinflated footballs during last season's AFC Championship game, which was a romp for the Patriots. Brady insists the NFL has no evidence he did anything wrong. The league claims that Brady destroyed his cell phone to obstruct its investigation. We're going to dig into this with Doug Eldridge, sports agent and uh, crisis communications expert for DLE Agency. So like Watergate, is Inflategate becoming more about the cover-up than the crime? That's exactly what my mom used to say to me. Son, the cover-up is most assuredly worse than the crime. When this started, it was about the three Ps, PSI, policy, and precedent. We're long since beyond the inflation standpoint and moving forward to appellate court. We're going to talk about the policy and the precedent behind this decision. So this is a four-game suspension by the NFL. Is that a fair penalty? How does it stack up with other NFL off-field penalties? The NFL would say fair is not an issue. It's appropriate based on the governing rules. Brady would say the converse. There's no precedent for this. You are suspending me almost based on a steroid standard, which provides a four-game suspension for the first offense. And the closest comparable example actually came with Brett Favre several years ago when the NFL said he failed to cooperate and gave him a $50,000 fine. Brady, by contrast, gets four games with an equivalent paycheck of about $1.8 million in lost salary. But this is a hugely successful athlete on the football field. What does this do to his career, to his legacy? Certainly. Perception is reality. Those that love Tom Brady will defend him to the end. Those that hate him... And there are more of us than them. <laughs> ...never needed this to begin with. Tom Brady, by and large, has been a lead-by-example guy. And I believe he will continue to do so throughout this appellate process, both off and on the field. So insofar as the ultimate damage to his reputation, that remains to be seen. But I think it will be minimal. You're talking about a championship quarterback that is most assuredly a first ballot Hall of Famer. All right, so Doug, hypothetically, you're his agent. What do you suggest he do? Be Tom Brady. Do everything that led you up to this point. Class, leadership, know when to speak, and almost more importantly, know when to say nothing. At this point, Tom needs to let the process take care of itself. It's gone to appeals court in New York. At this point, let's let the appeals process take hold and you focus on doing what made you Tom Brady. Not just great, we say made you Tom Brady. Execute when it matters most and that requires focus. He'd be wise to listen to your counsel. From the DLE agency, Doug Eldridge, thank you. Thank you. Well, the host city for the 2022 Winter Olympics is announced in Kuala Lumpur today. The International Olympic Committee has the honor to announce the host city of the Olympic Winter Games 2022. Beijing. <laughs> Beijing is the first city ever to host both the Winter and Summer Olympics. The 2008 Summer Games were held in China's capital city. Up next, this husband and father says Catholic teaching on marriage and sexuality is difficult, but worth it in the long run. And archaeologists dig through the ruins of what may be the hometown of a revered biblical figure. On Friday, July 31st, the Feast of St. Ignatius Loyola. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick. 
Encouragement for married couples has been the focus of tweets from Pope Francis this week. A recent article from the Theology of the Body Institute acknowledges the challenges facing today's married couples. Entitled Burn by NFP, it sheds light on how the spark of young love becomes enduring love perfected in fire. Damon Owens, Executive Director of the Theology of the Body Institute, joining us by Skype from the Philadelphia area. Damon, you write that you were never told how challenging being a parent and a husband would be. What wisdom do you have to share with young people who haven't been told either? Yeah, that's interesting. And um, the article really, is specifically with NFP, I won't getting at the, the the joy of love. And the young people in love really need to uh, enjoy the present moment, but recognize you don't need to know everything. You don't need to have a certain preparation. You need to really abide in that love that's real to you right now. Well, you and Melanie have been doing this for 20 plus years. How has your Catholic faith brought you this far in your marriage? Uh, like every relationship, what we did not fully understand, but we accepted as young uh, Catholic couple, uh, we now in 20 plus years later look back and see such wisdom in what the church teaches and what the church calls. And really for us, it was a transformation from a church that demands to a church that really calls and invites us to love in a way beyond our own ability. Well, let's face it, though, church teaching on marriage and sexuality and family is, is really difficult. I know as a young man, you probably bucked at that. How have you seen that wisdom, though, in that church teaching over time? Uh, it's all in the realm of love, Brian, and I don't mean that in a sentimental or, or some, uh, in just a sensual way. I mean, love is a demanding reality that you'll do for love what you won't do for a law. You'll do not just in the emotion, but you'll do for the good of another or something greater than yourself. So love is the teacher, even as love demands uh, in the moment. We have to hear the call, not as a, a, a rebuke or not as a, uh, uh, an obligation, but really as this, uh, the, the beautiful fulfillment of the love that, that we experience. And finally, you teach natural family planning. Are you able to convince young couples that it's worth it? Uh, it's, it's always a difficult, the whole marriage question is difficult. It, the, the demands, the vows, the reality of being in covenant with God, of the, of, of the fulfillment of the experience right now of, of human love, really in God's divine plan. So NFP becomes really the practicum, the place where all of these things convene. So you would expect all the convening of the difficulties, all the convening of the goods, and those who persevere and live in experience something really that can't be uh, compared anywhere else. Damon Owens with the Theology of the Body Institute. Damon, it's always good to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. God bless you. And archaeologists are digging all summer near the Sea of Galilee, unearthing what may have once been the home of the biblical saint Mary Magdalene. Mike, Mark Irons reports. Dawn on the Sea of Galilee. Before an early morning dig to discover the roots of Christianity, volunteers pray. Here in the ruins of the ancient town of Magdala, each swing of the pickaxe, an effort to uncover what life was like 2,000 years ago. Historians believe Jesus may have once walked these cobbled streets. This may have been the home to one of the most important figures of the Bible, Mary Magdalene, the first recorded witness of the resurrection. This is a holy site, I'm, I'm sure of that. Here we had only the preparation. Six years ago, Father Juan Solana purchased the land to build a Christian retreat. Israeli law required him to excavate, and completely by chance, he discovered a first century synagogue. It's considered ornate with mosaic flooring and frescoes. It is not for me. This is for millions of people that will come, will see this, will enjoy this as, as I did, and hopefully they will be able to discover our common roots. At the center, the altar, or bima, what is now called the Magdala Stone. This is the first time ever that a menorah carved on stone is found out of Jerusalem. Magdala may be one of the most important finds discovered in Israel in the last 50 years. Take out the soil and take out... Archaeologist Dr. Marcella Zapata has studied the town's purification baths. Remarkably, the baths still work to this day. They've also found coins and are working to restore pottery. Each piece tells a story about the common life, about the, the cooking, about the materials. And about the intersection of Judaism and Christianity. Mark Irons, EWTN News Nightly. Thank you, Mark, and thanks for watching. Until Monday, good night.